Welcome. You're listening to an episode of the New Pi podcast, The World Stage. My name is Ole Jakob Sending. I'm here with professor in international relations at the University of Witwatersrand, Malte Brosik, and my New Pi colleague and research professor, John uh, Karlsru. We're here in San Francisco, where the UN was founded in 1945. Uh, the role of the UN has changed a lot uh, over the years. And different UN organizations are, are not able to handle many of the world's crises in the way that the uh, member states intended the UN to do. And you've just published uh, a paper called How do ad hoc coalitions deinstitutionalize international institutions? It came out in International Affairs and in it you do discuss uh, how different governing mechanisms are emerging as a result in part at least uh, because the UN is not functioning uh, in the way that it was intended. So I wanted to ask you, first off, can you tell us a little bit about the main argument of, of the article? Um, yeah, thanks for, for, for having me here, and it's a pleasure being um, in that conversation with you. Um, yeah, the main argument um, is that um, these ad hoc um, um, mechanisms or ad hoc coalitions, uh, which are spontaneously emerging, very task specific, but also operating with a limited time frame, um, are posing a quite significant challenge to the established um, institutional frameworks. And you mentioned the UN, one may also add um, other regional organizations in our context, the African Union, yeah. um, uh, peace and security um, architecture. The main argument um, that we are making is that they are kind of weakening these existing um, institutions. I think we come up with um, quite a lot of empirical detail here. John? Um, yeah, <clears throat> you said that um, the UN may not be doing the job it was intended to, but also we, we see that maybe the situation on the ground is such that it's not necessarily the UN that is the best tool. And many times uh, coalitions are providing a better instrument to deal with, with crisis or in the security crisis. Um, however, um, what is it interesting to see with them is that they are also, because they're, they're quite popular, uh, they're, they're flexible, easy to set up, easy to dissolve. They're providing um, opportunities for states to act swiftly without too many ties that bind over time. So uh, quite powerful alternative to existing institutions. But does that mean, so, the, so it, from the title, the mechanisms that you're describing with ad hoc coalitions, they are deinstitutionalizing established international institutions. But from the way that you describe it now, that may not be a bad thing. They're solving problems more effectively than, than established institutions. Or what, what are the trade-offs that you, that you see? <clears throat> it's a bit of a, I mean, it's a difficult but important question, and um, maybe we, we disagree on uh, the oh, good, good. answer. Good, let's, <laughs> let's hear, let's hear, yeah. Um, no, I would always argue that, um, okay, they are actually more complementary than um, a significant substantial challenge. Uh, and because most ad hoc coalitions, um, at least the ones that we are looking at in the security environment in Africa, are uh, not exactly operating in the field where the regional as well as the global organizations uh, are the most effective ones. So when it comes, for instance, to fighting uh, terrorism, and we look exactly yeah. at Boko Haram, and uh, while the UN, for instance, has a very elaborate and um, framework on, on peacekeeping, and so has the African mm -hmm. Union, um, fighting insurgencies, uh, terrorist organizations, which are at the moment um, the greatest source of threat for uh, for uh, African population. Mm. Um, I mean, these organizations have not been set up and are not actually geared to um, engaging these kind of um, actors. So in that regard, they're doing something different, but <laughs> John, yeah. maybe you want to jump well, yeah. in here. Well, I'll, I'll help Malta out because he basically uses the, the, the term of functional differentiation between when, so they are doing different tasks. Yeah. So the UN and NATO coalitions are not doing the same thing, right? for the time being at least. There has been a lot of push from member states to push the UN in that direction, mm -hmm. um, which I've written about elsewhere. But it's not really set up to, to do counterinsurgency or, or counterterrorism tasks. For, and that's, that's a good thing, I think. 
But the African Union does have that in, in their kind of the repertoire of tasks. Oh, yeah. So that's a more direct competition, you could say, where the, the argument of functional differentiation is not mm. perhaps a, as strong. Okay. Um, and what we detail in, in uh, our paper is that uh, uh, we, we look at the, the Lake Chad uh, region where the Boko Haram, you might remember, um, uh, kidnapped a lot of uh, school children and so yeah. forth. It's yeah. been really uh, a challenge for a long time. And so this multinational joint task force was set up by five countries around Lake Chad um, in the end of 2014 and has been fighting Boko Haram since. Mm. Um, with authorization from the African Union, but not with the mandate as per se, which means so that... So what's the legal difference between the uh, two? And that, that's quite interesting. So the, the AU, the African Union, Peace yeah. and Security Council, can, can give its a kind of um, support in basically four different ways. But um, I, if it should be an African Union operation, it's only when it's a mandate. Okay. So it's authorized. And this is important because that meant that it could then receive funding uh, from the EU through the AU. Uh, okay, and so it opened a yeah. financing source. Okay. Uh, and as we detail in the paper, the financing regime of the EU has in that period changed. So now um, in 2020 or 2021, I can't remember exactly now, uh, from what was called the African Peace Facility to the European Peace Facility, or snidingly called uh, in Addis Ababa, now the Ukrainian Peace Facility, but that's perhaps another story. Okay. Um, and that change, the, the, this change in financing rules meant that fun, funding that went through the African Union now goes, uh, a lot of it now goes directly to the multinational joint task force. So the African Union has been sidelined. Not only has it not the responsibility for the mission itself and maybe most will get more into the details of why that happened um, that's about regional competition and so forth mm. but now it's also lost a lot of the funding that went through the african union and gave it some kind of leverage on and so the what would then be the 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 interests of the african union to to authorize rather than establish a mandate because it seems from what you're saying that the african union is shooting itself in the foot yeah. if funding is now channeled through other uh, mechanisms? Of, of, of course, it's also a question of um, authority here. Um, yeah. Well, if they are not in the game whatsoever, they become irrelevant um, yeah. Yeah. after all. right? Yeah. So we treat the MNJTF also as a kind of role model. Uh, if, if this goes well, then this might be replicated. Uh, right. Because it provides incentives then, okay, you uh, follow good practices. And mm, mm. I, I think it's a good practice overall, uh, generally speaking. Mm. Um, <clears throat> and um, the African Union, of course, doesn't really have its own resources. I mean, that escalates um, actually the sit situation. Yes, there's the peace fund, but the peace, and, and that, that peace fund might actually also be used for a hot coalition. I think they are going in that direction, but the peace fund itself is just too small to um, fund uh, over a longer period um, these costly um, operations. Mm. So that shift of, of resources, which is kind of part of our definition of deinstitutionalization, is, is quite a, a major one. And I think in, in, in the paper there is so ample and straightforward evidence that, mm. <laughs> yeah. you know, um, w w and without these funding resources that the EU does not administer directly, then yeah. of course you become less relevant. And by the way, they have done that before. So that shift of funding initially of the APF was going through the African Union and then to the MNJTF. This has now changed completely. So um, may, maybe expand on the acronyms you just, yeah. you just um, used. African Peace Facility yeah. and European Peace Facility. Right. Those, yeah. So there was this shift from yeah. the so-called APF uh, to the EPF and that's a quite significant big step and we could, you know, when we were there, yeah. it was so um, so obvious that this has um, a direct direct impact. Of, mm. of course, it gives the MNJTF much more authority, much more political leverage as well. Yeah. And it's also wanted by the main actor on the ground and this is Nigeria. So uh, can you can you explain or elaborate a little bit on on how this is set up in the in practice? So you have the multinational joint task force that's Boko Haram and um, around Lake Chad, right? And then yeah. you had the multinational security support mission to to Haiti. Are these, you know, set up, organized in the same way? Who decides on who's the 
you know, the general leading it? Uh, how, how is that, you know? So what you mentioned are two different coalitions. Mm -hmm. And uh, elsewhere we worked on kind of what are other coalitions, how we try to map them, we try to define what it is. Um, and generally there is a lead state. Um, and where, what are those in the, these cases? So Nigeria, uh, in the case of the multinational joint task force, yeah. and for the, the, the to be, because the other mission has not yet happened. It's, right. it's, uh, it was authorized in the autumn. Uh, and was supposed to be led by Kenya, okay. uh, but uh, things are not moving uh, very fast. Okay. So Kenya has still not deployed troops to, okay. to Haiti to help out in the security situation. And are there then troops from different countries that contribute? Yes. Uh, together with, the, in this case, Nigeria, for example? Yes. So in the case of the Lake Chad, it's uh, the neighboring countries, uh, Benin, uh, Cameroon, Chad, Niger, and Nigeria. Yeah. And it's interesting. Um, we have to go back to the case of to, to the African Union. So the African Union was early there with planners. They sent planners to help out planning the mission. Mm, mm. But and the African Union has has you know over time invested significantly in building up what is called the African Peace and Security Architecture. Mm. And within this, there is a standby force, the African Standby Force. Yes, and Norway. Lots of other donor countries, EU significantly, Germany, has put a lot of money into developing this standby force and the whole architecture. Yeah. So when there is a crisis on the continent, the, the vision was this would be deployed. This tool and, would yeah. be de deployed. Yeah, yeah. But in practice, what is happening is that you know um, you're not using the tool. Maybe you're using parts of it. Uh, you know, okay. Exploit the plan. Use a little bit of planning. You use some of the the troops, some of the doctrine, but then you go together because you don't want to have a precedence for future deployments and for spending through the so AU. So is that why they're not using the, the standby force? Nigeria and... wants to be in control. They don't want, oh, to, okay. they want to control okay. what is happening in their area. Yeah. It's a, you know, it's a major power in, in yeah. on the African but continent. When it comes to Boko Haram, I mean, they're also operating inter-regionally, right? So right. most African, re I mean, yeah. The standby force is built on the idea that there are different African regions, but they're all a little bit artificial. No one knows exactly where their <laughs> boundary limits are. So, and, and this conflict uh, crosses those boundaries. So there's five different regional economic communities in, mm. in the African standby force concept. Mm. Uh, but the conflict doesn't really, you know, I see. So it's, so it's not self evident boundaries. which uh, sub regional organization would take action, yeah. and then kind of the fallback option was uh, Nigeria's choice for the multinational joint task force, which mm. exists for some time already, but it was dormant, so basically non existent mm. before. So, could you, this is really interesting stuff, and I'm wondering how, how you. How did you do the research? How did you come up with this? How did you first observe this uh, phenomenon? And how did you, you know, um, come to write this article? Well, we had uh, done a conceptual piece uh, earlier on in the project. And we agreed that the multinational joint task force would be an interesting case study because it's crisscrossing regions. Mm. It is, you know, authorized by the African Union, but not mandated. So yeah. it's it's kind of competing a little bit that's that's fairly clear from the outset um, and then we went to Chad uh, together uh, and did interviews uh, with the, the general and with the, the, the international community there the, the general the Nigerian general heading the, the force and other people in the in the, in the force and then this task force and later on, on the same trip, we went to Addis. And that's when it kind of dawned on us, no? Yeah, I mean, f first chart was very important to see how um, the MNJTF works on, on, on the ground. And mm. we also went to um, the AU's office and the EU's office mm -hmm. and so on. And you can, could really get the um, impression how um, things are uh, arranged um, on the ground. And um, of course, we, we noticed immediately like, okay, these funding streams have changed so significantly and we recognize that what the role of Nigeria is when, when
when speaking to the force commander, you made yeah. it extremely explicit. You know? Yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> you know, yeah. This is yeah. what that Nigeria was a fun wants. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, later on, over we after that we went to to, to Addis and we were forced for um, a few days off with getting food poisoning, I think, from an Italian restaurant. Time, time for then, reflection. Time for reflection, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and uh, I think we started just writing down some bullet points. Right. And uh, I think I started down. Uh, I, I think I was writing on or proposing like two titles or so and one was about deinstitutionalization and John said yeah that's the one <laughs> <laughs> yeah so we developed that from there yeah. so you, you've touched upon this about why this is happening I mean the the conflicting mm. interests uh, and the, the organizational design and challenges with that but mm. is this also reflecting of a broader trend that I would think that it is yeah. based on what I know about these uh, types of organizations um, the MNJTF is a single case, right? And the, the article yeah. that we have written is based on a single case, which is, from a methodological point of view, always a bit risky. Mm. But the advantage is we go really deep into uh, empirical detail, and that is very much needed when making such strong arguments that ad hoc coalitions deinstitutionalize existing institutions. However, it's not a single, late, uh, isolated single case. It really stands for a longer, but still emerging, developing mm. uh, trend, especially in the African environment when it comes to peace and security. But it's definitely not uh, limited to the security and environment. I think in the project, we're also working on health issues and um, other colleagues have written a, a qualitative paper and, 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 and there's a historical at, at piece. The long uh, perspective there and it's actually at all coalitions are not even a new phenomenon but they haven't been recognized properly hmm. but so is this so like the the g7 g20 yeah world economic forum because that's is what that I part of the same that's what i wouldn't wanted to pick up on uh, and i uh, there's this this trend towards informality towards um uh, the kind of the change of roles where international organizations are increasingly becoming service providers to more informal um, arenas, like what you say, the G7, the G20. I think this is part of it. And in, in those arenas, the, the international organizations are competing with other uh, informal um, arrangements that uh, may be more temporary and thus be more attractive when there is, you know, there is increasing uh, costs uh, attached to to try to come to agreement in the existing international institutions. Um, there is just too much tension, too too difficult to come yeah. to agreement yeah. many times, uh, or to get the deal that you want. I think it's interesting though because there is this parallel development where I think we have talked about this before, John. Where, for example many international or regional organizations are now sitting around waiting, hoping to be tasked mm -hmm. by the G7 or the G20. Uh, and if these organizations worked as they should, that shouldn't be the case, right? So because now we have all of a sudden this small club of great powers on top, and they are so, uh, for them, for these organizations, it's so important to be seen, to get resources, to get recognition, mm -hmm. that being tossed by this informal club who no one gave a mandate to do anything becomes the most important thing. Mm. Uh, and in, in light of that, there is also, I think, a question of, of a more geopolitical or whatever development. So, um, okay, you describe now ad hoc coalitions to address certain challenges, crises in, in Africa. Could you imagine uh, some, somewhere in Asia that you have a similar type of ad hoc coalition to address border issues or a terrorist group or whatever, which means no one is then policing anything. Mm -hmm. You can just go ahead and do it if you have a few states uh, agreeing to do so. Yeah, and in principle, for sure. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, what I also found uh, interesting is that, I mean, when we speak about crisis of multilateralism and uh, great power rivalry and so on, we often refer to the US, Russia, 
China, Ukraine, etc. Uh, but we also see this in very many different contexts, actually. A, a similar game is, is happening. And in Africa, with more than 50 countries, it's not guaranteed that yeah. you have an agreement <laughs> on yes. much, no. actually. Yeah. And the easier way is then to just uh, set up a group of friends and do yes. your own stuff and yeah. then seek international blessing from your regional organization, yeah. maybe from the UN later or from external actors yeah. um, as well. So yeah. um, I'm pretty sure that you know this kind of model is attractive um, in, in many places yeah you could say that um, in an earlier book I did with the, that kind of preceded this this project with um, Eve Rakers who's also uh, yeah. working on this project together with uh, us too um, we uh, we looked at these standby force arrangements that NATO Af African Union the European Union all have mm. and we discovered that none of them had ever been used Significant resources have been invested in setting them up, mm. but they are not being used because the, the ties that bind the kind of the, the, the risk of precedence of the risk of 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 tying your country to a longer term kind sure. of commitment mm. uh, makes the, a strong argument for not using them, but rather using parts of it like the, the kind of the. So this in, is exactly yeah. where our talk coalitions are jumping in because yeah. uh, we, it's a functional gap again yeah. <laughs> that yeah, they yeah, are addressing. Yeah. That's a capacity shortage from the perspective of the larger organizations. Mm. But um, I mean, I don't want to overrate it. It still makes a lot of sense to have these standby brigades and so on because yeah. they only they are all they were also creating the conditions and the context where uh, the talk coalitions could actually be set up. On, like in increasing interoperability and, and stuff like this. I think without this prior training and the African um, standby forces, it would be much more difficult than for Nigeria to set something up like the MNJTF. Of course, that makes a lot of sense. But states, if they, they put continue to put money year after year mm -hmm. into arrangements that are never being used, they will not continue with that. Sure. So, yep. so then you will... It, uh, at least I would predict that you would start to see a, a, a kind of a drop in funding to set it, to these kind of arrangements. Um, they, they're costly. Yeah. So the larger consequences of this is so as as the as you mentioned, which is in the title about deinstitutionalization. So and the the long the potential long term consequences are pretty negative. Uh, but then again, the flip side is well, there is a problem. To be solved right now, mm -hmm. how do you do it? And you you aren't able in most cases to do that through the established institutions. Mm -hmm. So, what would then be your prediction if this is a trend that you see uh, in this area? I think it's fair to say that you also see it in other issue areas, not only in peace and security, right? What what will that you know result in? A crystal ball question. <laughs> I love them. Yeah. <laughs> the, I mean, it's, it's easier. I, I, would, I would assume that there are differences between policy areas. For, yeah, yeah. First of yeah. all, so a general statement is, is difficult. Okay, but um, let's, but let's with, focus on with, within, security. within yeah. the security environment in yeah. Africa and so on, and yeah. taking into account the peacekeeping drawdown that we are happening, that, yeah. that we are witnessing right um, right now, it really looks like. Um, the trend of uh, more ad hoc coalitions um, is pretty strong and they will replace to a large extent um, the arrangement that we have right now. Will they be more effective? <laughs> you know, this is something mm. that also from our experience in, in, in Shad is, and the force commander was actually straightforward and said, no, we cannot defeat Bogoram. <laughs> it's just, it's basically about containment. So okay. will they be more effective than the instrument that we have already? I don't think so. So um, questions will be asked uh, a few years down the road as yeah. well of, uh, you know, what are these ad hoc coalitions leading to? What can they solve in terms of problems? Mm. And that answer is, is open. It's a much kind of in the sec areas of security, of course, uh, as you said, it's different from, from policy domain to policy domain. But in the area of security, there's been a scaling back of ambition. So at the moment, uh, states are pretty happy with just trying to deal with symptoms and not so much with root causes. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, the kind of the liberal paradigm of, of trying to deal and, and help build peace, that's, that's kind of gone at the moment. So you have in parallel with the, you know, the institutionalization, you also have a scaling down of how ambitious 
uh, is the approach to uh, attacking a problem. Mm. Yeah. So, okay, you've mentioned the security area, but I, I do think we see signs of some of the same in other issue areas, right? So that raises an even bigger, trickier question about um, the, the balance, as it were, between input legitimacy, where member states decide on something together, give mandate, pool resources, all of that, and output legitimacy, which comes from actually acting on addressing problems out there. You see it in in health, uh, in climate, in finance, where, where non-state actors or ad hoc coalitions, as you would, would call them, of states, just try to address a problem together without going through formalized procedures. Mm. Now, does that mean that, you know, uh, the UN the AU and other organizations will become basically talking shops and all the action will be done elsewhere. Mm. <laughs> There's a certain risk, oh, at least. Yeah. <laughs> they, they, they're definitely getting weaker because there's more competition and that, that shift of, of, of power is um, happening. But we shouldn't um, overrate ad hoc coalitions as well, right? So the basic definition is also that they are not permanent. Right. Um, right, and um, if we are honest, we, we also see in, in Africa the G5 uh, Sahel joint force, for example, collapsed very quickly <laughs> before it was really doing much, okay. right? So yeah. Yeah. Um, there is still the need for uh, a more permanent organization and mm-hmm. for more secretariat-led um, solutions. And, and one of the maybe more negative trends that we also identify is that with ad hoc coalitions, you know, you, you're, you're skipping a lot of these useful scripts and policies that, you know, mm-hmm. people were fighting for in terms of democracy, human rights, accountability, mm-hmm. and, and so yeah, on yeah. and so yeah. forth. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, was saying, I, I still believe that there's a need to, to implement that good stuff, mm. right? But if it's implementable at a very large level, I mean, this looks extremely complicated, politically speaking. Mm. I think you touch on a, a quite important um, as, uh, issue. It, to me, it seems like states, at least like Norway, where I'm from, and a lot of other similar states, have been operating for the last 20 years under the assumption that um, the operative side of international organizations is not is not as necessary as right. the kind of the normative dimension. Yeah. Yeah. It's an arena to meet and, and set norms, yeah. etc. Yeah. Uh, but we can find other and more effective partners, uh, at least in some instances. Um, security is kind of special because it's you know state based, but in other areas like climate or health, private partners, philanthropic partners, can do as much or more, can be more effective. Uh, but this this is kind of operating under the assumption that there's not re- that the kind of the, the normative dimension is not dependent on the operational the dimension of these organizations. And what is what if that is actually uh, not correct? I I think that's not correct. Yeah. That uh, if you only do the normative and not do the operational. Over time, an organization will lose credibility and relevance. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, so well, the talk will move to other places, to more informal yes. venues. Yes. So, on that happy note, uh, it's been a pleasure talking to you. And congratulations with a very good and important uh, uh, article. Um, you have listened to an episode of the New P podcast, the World uh, Stage. Thank you for listening in.